first episode of 2024. I know it's been, I've been very bad about getting to my uh, podcast episodes, but I've been waiting for this special guest. I didn't want to start the new year off uh, without talking to Alana. So I will do my introductions really quickly. So not that you really need an introduction at this point, Alana, but Alana is uh, lives in New York City, as you can see behind her. That is is really New York City behind her, Manhattan. Uh, she holds uh, key leadership positions as the Educational Technology Director and, it's a big and, uh, Data Protection Officer. And I know how difficult that job is. So those are two big jobs. They really should be two jobs, but, uh, and they are. Yeah. Uh, and you are at the Pocantico. Did I get that right? No, Pocanico. No one gets Pocanico. it right. Okay. Most <laughs> people aren't even close. You were close. Right. Hill Central School District. And she's also the Hudson Valley Director uh, for NiceGate, which is uh, a organization that both of us uh, love and uh, go to the conference regularly. Um, so you are the author. I have my copy of the book right here. I have it signed. Uh, the book, The Generative Age, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Education. Uh, Alana, I've been, you know, of course, reading up on the book again. I read it over the summer. I reread it recently or just kind of picked out uh, different pieces of the book. And it really is, it's not a huge, like, thick book, but you get right to the point of AI, and which is, I think, perfect, especially for teachers we're busy. We've got, uh, you know, got a lot going on. So you really kind of focus the chapters of this book and we'll dig more into it. Maybe you can give us more kind of uh, goodies as to what your thought process was going into the book. Yeah. But if you're a teacher, especially you want to pick up this book. And even I think a parent would be, would benefit from this book because you really dig into the big issues that surround AI which can get complicated and seem confusing, especially if you've just been kind of paying attention to it on the surface. But I just, it really is a one-stop shop book for educators, especially to wrap your head around all of the nuances of AI and uh, really make this tool a productive tool in education. So great job on the book. Thank you. Um, you're also the host of the Generative Age podcast powered by nice game which we know yeah. and love again and um i think i'll let you dig into more of that mm -hmm. as we chat because i'd really rather hear you talk about it than me um you have received the innovative tech director award from both tech and learning gosh i love that magazine great magazine and great uh they do lots of really fun uh uh, what would you call them? conferences or meetups yeah. and that sort of thing they're really great um as well as the lhric which maybe you can fill us in on the the acronym there and you are now a finalist hopefully a winner soon of the magic school ai educator of the year and an edsafe woman in ai fellow you can get in touch with alana through twitter or x uh at alana winnick all right Let's like dig right mouthful. into the questions. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a mouthful. You've yeah. got a lot of accomplishments under your belt. Yeah. But let's just start with something fun. First of all, let's talk about your favorite. What's your, do you have a favorite blend, a favorite cup of coffee, or just a favorite drink in general? Um. So for coffee, I used to have a Keurig machine, and I've switched to Nespresso. And I feel like I love my Nespresso machine. I could never go back to a Keurig because if I, I drink it black and I, and it gives you this nice, like creamy layer of foam at the top and it doesn't feel like black coffee. It feels like you're drinking this coffee from like a fancy place. So I love my Nespresso machine because of that, like creamy layer of foam at the top. Very nice. Okay. I want to do something fun. I'm going to try and bring up my screen and hopefully sure. Can you see that? Oh, I see it. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is supposed to be the two of us. So this is me, a real picture of me on the right and a generative AI picture of you on the left. Is that yeah. real? That is, I never posed for that picture ever. Um, it's not me. It's so funny because that's part of the things that I wanted to talk to you about. So when I was writing the book, I wrote it pretty quickly and then it was like, okay, it's time to publish. And 
there's all these other things you have to do for a book that I never thought of. Like you, then they're like, okay, now why don't you start working on your dedication? Like, oh my goodness. Or now you have to do your acknowledgements. Now you have to do your about the author section. There's all these sections that I didn't think about. I'm like, okay, we need your about the author picture. I'm like, wait, my what? And then I'm like, wait, do I have to hire a photographer and take these professional pictures? And I actually really hate taking pictures. Like since I was little, I, it's just, I don't like taking pictures. And that was just giving me a lot of stress around this picture thing. So then I'm thinking, oh, well, my book's about AI. Let me make an AI generated image. It's totally acceptable. So in the my journey section of the book, I talk about my journey with AI and I talk about that experience of how I really was stressed about taking this about the author picture and I use AI. And so if you look at, at my screen, uh, I have a ring light on that off. If you look at my phone screen really carefully, all of those pictures are not me. They're all AI generated. I don't know if you could really see them. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Later, but um, they're not me. Oh, there we go. None of these are me. Wow. None that's, of them. I didn't pose amazing. for any of them. So it's pretty incredible what you could do with AI. Well, that's that's amazing. Let me just show you the other picture that was generated from this because it's, it's, I put in, I, I decided I would do a generative AI picture and I'm going to embarrass myself here. <laughs> and so this is what AI came up with. Can you see that? Yeah. that's. <laughs> so that's me, grandpa. Like, come what on. Did you, what did you use <laughs> to make that one? I put like over 50 glasses uh with a sweater or something that or a, a sweater vest i love sweater vests and with a cup of coffee with thumbs up and that's what i got grandpa so oh so you typed in a prompt and it made the image is that yes, oh, okay. yes. So yeah with, i didn't like with mine what i did was you can upload selfies okay a software so you take selfies and then you upload oh, it oh and, and then they oh, see that's what i needed to do see just describing myself really made myself look, look terribly old yeah but. so i think that yeah that's what i did i uploaded selfies and then there's lots of different outfits and you have to find them that like resonates with you and are you going for a professional look or like what kind of look like it's a lot of <laughs> like decisions to make but well well it did a great job for you not so much yeah. for me but thank you all right, so let's talk, let's dig into you a little bit. Let's talk about your educational journey. And, you know, how did you end up where you are today? Um, That's like one of the most interesting questions because I never really chose any of these things. It, Like I always say, it didn't, I didn't choose it, it chose me. And the past four jobs did not exist before me and were literally created for me. Um. And I think that that's just a world that we are about to live in right now. Like the jobs that our students are about to get probably don't exist and they need to learn how to create opportunities for themselves where they don't exist anymore. And I've really literally been doing that the past four times, but I started off as an elementary educator and I, that was back in the day when the smart board first came out and I was helping teachers um, cause they were like, how did you make that lesson? It was super interactive. And then I was helping my colleagues on their lunch prep before school, after school. I didn't know that that was a job. I don't think there was a really a such thing at the time as a tech integrator. And I did not know that that could be a job. And at the time it was really hard to find a job. So I had to go back to get my master's because we have no choice in New York state and everyone was doing literacy or special ed. And I wanted to stand out. And I found a degree from Pace University in educational technology. I didn't even know what I would ever do with it. I just thought it would make me look different. And then I realized that was actually a real job. And when I couldn't find a job because it was nearly impossible at that time, I took a job in Mayapac as a computer lab teaching assistant because I didn't want to be a substitute because I felt like, you know, kids just don't, it's like a vacation day for them. So I was like, I don't want to be a sub. So I took that job. And when I went in for my interview, I was like a little bit you know, confident. And I was asking some pretty aggressive questions. And I was like, well, I notice you don't have a very large tech department. Are you thinking about expanding it? And they're like, actually, we are. And so I went in for that job. Um, most of my job was things I could automate. So I literally paid at the time, there's no such thing as data privacy and security laws. I 
paid for software on my own, created accounts, pitched it to the district, automated my job and started doing the job I wanted. And then they created a job to keep me because they were like, this girl is probably going to leave the second teaching job opens up. So that was the first job created for me. And then I applied for a different job at Lyric, the LHRIC, the Lower Hudson Regional Information Center. And they're like, you would leave? And I was like, yeah, for the right opportunity. And they're like, check back in a couple weeks. And then there's something posted applied, got that, got a promotion there. And then during the pandemic, I was supporting the whole lower Hudson Valley region. And one of my districts where I work now, Pecanico Hills, were like, we really can't share you anymore. And so I jumped ship and I went there. And now I work with Lyric just on the other side. I'm the client now. And, and yeah, and they just nominated me for their innovator award. And Marina won the teacher innovator award. So we won together. So that's really, oh, that's it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my journey of how I got here. That doesn't involve the book and the podcast, but we're about to get to that. I see in your question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, you really did uh, set that up well as it really did find you. It's almost, uh, I've, I've likened it to my, I feel like my path took that way as well. And um, it's kind of like riding just a wave, you know, like the wave is there and let's just take it and see where it goes. Yeah. I think um, it's about being open-minded to things as they come right like a lot of people are scared of change and I think change could be good change could be exciting um when you step and and Andy you, I'm going to credit you for one of the biggest things for growth for me is like when you really step outside your comfort zone and you do something that's super uncomfortable that usually equates to growth, right? And and you supporting me on getting on a massive stage for the first time ever in my career in front of over a thousand people is really scary. But you grow so much in those times you feel uncomfortable. So if something feels a little scary and feels an, a little uncomfortable, that's usually a good thing. Go for it. Try it. And if it doesn't work, what? So what? You'll. It's fine. You yeah, grew. Well, learned. You knocked it out of the park, our nice gate, uh, kind of TED Talk version. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still, it was very memorable. So I'm I'm glad that that was a rewarding experience for you. Yeah. So you become a podcaster and an author, it's really impressive. And so tell me about that process for you. Um, let's start with you know, with podcasting, did the show come, how did the show come about and what are some tips you'd give other podcasters out there? I'm always looking for new tips as well. And then let's dig into the, we'll dig into the book, but let's start with podcast. Yeah. So like I said before, I didn't choose any of these things. They just kind of <laughs> happened to me. Um, when AI came out, uh, I was like, this is big. We should do something about it for nice gate. Cause I'm on the board there. And I'm like, we should host a webinar and I didn't really necessarily feel super comfortable. So I brought someone else on with me so we can handle it. And it was just like, what is this thing called AI? And it was just a webinar. And within the first 48 hours, literally 200 people registered for this webinar. And if you listen back to the first episode, it is a Zoom meeting and the settings weren't set up correctly and people are just coming in the Zoom meeting and you can hear those doorbells and people are unmuted and you can hear the noise. Like it's it's not a real podcast. It was a true webinar. And then we had the next webinar episode featuring Tim Needles talking about AI, um, art, design, and music because he's in. he wrote a book called Steam Power. And the webinar sort of evolved into a podcast because the content was so great. And I'm like, we need to reach a larger audience. And we're just going to post Zoom links. So I was like, let's just post this as a uh, podcast and I never really thought that it would ever be a podcast or dreamt of it or prepared for it and I didn't necessarily I, I don't know I've been learning things as I go and it's been evolving and I think just finding mentors out there that are doing things and asking them what works what doesn't work and and being open to asking for constructive feedback I think I'm very open to that some people are not as they're a little bit hesitant for that, but I think I always welcome it because I think, you know, you're a podcaster, you want to give your audience what they want, right? So you need to ask what, like, what do you like? What don't you like? Um, so that's kind of sort of how it, how it evolved. Things that um, I was considering as I made my podcast is like, what style do you want? Um, you know, yours is an interview. Maybe some of them, they're not an interview. It's a one-on-one, -on -one, like, it, or I mean, it's just you, it's a monologue. So 
George Kiros really challenged me to do at least one a month myself, which I'm going to do this month. So I'm going to do one guest, spotlight guest. And then my second one a month will be uh, all the AI news and updates, which I normally do in the beginning. That'll be in the second episode, as well as a way that I've integrated this in the classroom with teachers and students. So just hear more of my voice. So I'm going to try that. So just playing with styles. And if you try something, like George told me to split each episode into two, I tried it. It didn't really work for me. So I combined them back. So just being open to trying things, seeing if they work, they don't work, tweaking things. If you don't like it, change it back. You might want to consider the length. Like I produce and edit a different podcast. That's not my voice. And that one, there's no guests. It's just the knowledge, the people sharing knowledge. And they're really short. They're 10 minute chunks. So do you want yours to be short? Do you want it to be long? Do you want it to have guests? Do you not want it to have guests? How often are you posting? Are you posting once a week, once a month, twice a month? There's all these things to consider. And then with editing, some people don't edit and they just put it out like raw content. Other people edit. If you're going to edit, like what software are you using to record? What software are you using to edit? Then you have to get into hardware. Like what microphone are you using? Um, I have a ring light because I record video. If you want yours with video, then you can host it. I think the only one that really enables video is Spotify. And then I have that feed everywhere else. But if you post it on like Apple as your start, you can't get video anywhere else. So there's just a lot of like software and hardware tweaks to play with. Um, and then I think just doing what feels manageable to you with all these things. Uh, I don't I don't think you should overwhelm yourself. I think just start small, do what works. You can always challenge yourself and push yourself to do more, but you don't want to burn yourself out. And I feel like for me, it became overwhelming. I thought about doing a weekly podcast, but I've been getting some pretty big guests on my podcast. And I don't think that that's sustainable for me to keep the quality of the guests and they're over an hour. They're about an hour. I'd say they're approximately one hour long and I do edit them myself. And people are like, why don't you just offload the editing to someone else? But for me, that's a time when I'm really analyzing myself. I'm analyzing my speaking to become a better speaker. I'm analyzing my questioning techniques and being like, oh, I should have asked this. And I think that the editing, I don't want to pass off to someone else because I think that it helps me grow. And people are always like, maybe AI could do it for you. I'm like, no, this is a time when I think that the human is really important because if you are analyzing yourself for growth, that's helpful. Like, yeah, I could ask AI for feedback too, but I, I do think self-reflection is really important. You're on mute, you're on mute. Thank you, classic mistake. You know, I think those tips and tricks are really good. And I think I would add to those is that, you know, the guests, you, you really kind of hit on it, like having quality guests. And there's so many people in the education realm or such shares that you can get really good people sharing yeah. that will do it for, you know, hey, it's seven o'clock at night. Sure, I'll, I'll do it. You know, yeah. uh, there's such we have such a great community of educators that it's easy to get some really awesome guests. And I guess also is just be, have a curious heart, I guess, you know, um, I think that helps draw, draw people in as, as those kind of curious questions beyond, um, you know, just your ordinary, how are you, what's new kind of thing. So it's good stuff. So let's talk about the book. Um, again, so much in this book. I, I mean, how, how did you get this out so quickly? Because there's so much relevant good stuff but there's also serious topics you know how do we handle cheating in school with kids and, and ai so let, let's dig into that one so i think for me i say this it's funny it's like it's not about the ai it's about the ai obviously the book is about ai but it's not really about the ai to me because i've always felt like education needed to change i really recently a couple months ago graduated with my third degree and I was very recently a student. And I think that sometimes school sucks. Like it's not fun, it's not engaging, it's not fun. And and I really don't want my students in my school district to feel the way that I felt. And I think 
with especially now with AI, where AI can produce the end product for us, we need to really rethink what we're asking of students and what's important. So I think for me, and, and, and Andy, you work in ed tech too. When the pandemic came out, I think for me, it was obviously with what was going on in the world was very horrible. I don't want to take away from any of that. But in our field, it was a very exciting time where people were doing things we always dreamed that they would ever do. And now we're like, it's actually happening. They're where they should be, not not even in the future. They're where they should be. And then I felt like very quickly when things started going back to normal, people were burnt out. They had like technology fatigue. They didn't even want to look at a computer anymore. And things kind of sort of went back to the way that they were. And it really crushed me because I'm like, we came so far. And I felt like with AI, it was like the catalyst for change. So all these ideas I had always had about how we need to change education, AI was just a catalyst to get there. So if you remove the word AI and you read the book, it's still the same things, right? Like we know about good teaching practices, like the strategies I'm suggesting are not even anything that foreign. We know about the flipped classroom. We know about project-based learning. We know about all these things that there's data behind them. And now it's just very relevant in this world because AI can write an essay. So we have to change. Um, so yeah, it is about AI, but it's also just about the future of education. That's why it says that part, AI and the future of education. Um, and the way that I wrote it so fast is I use dictation. So I I think, thank you, Andy. I think I'm a decent speaker and you made me better, but um, I... I never thought I was the strongest writer. I, I mean, maybe because I'm surrounded by other people who are really, really strong. But I do have ideas. And I think I personally communicate better through speaking. So I use a lot of dictation. I, if I'm driving or I'm walking, I had my phone because you can't type and drive. And I would dictate my thoughts. And I just got them all out. And then what I did is I took that and I ran it through AI. So removed all my filler words, my like, my um. And it restructured it instead of a long blob of incoherent were not incoherent but strung together words that are not formatted in paragraphs or bullets and it took my thoughts my ideas and structured it in more of like a book type format and then I went back and edited it because I want to make sure it still sounded like me and when I asked a bunch of my own teachers in my school district to read the book to give me ideas and feedback what resonated what didn't where they were so confused a lot of them were super confused like I don't understand how you used AI. Like you said, you use AI to write the book, but it sounds like your voice. Like while I'm reading this, it sounds like you are speaking to me. How? And I think it's because I wrote through dict dict dictation, ran it through the AI, and then went back and I edited it to make sure that it felt and sounded like me and all the final thoughts were my own. I also bounced ideas back and forth off the AI. Like, what am I missing? If I made a list on bias and discrimination, maybe I was missing a bullet and I didn't even think about it. Of course, I would always go back and fact check and make sure that everything that I put in the book was accurate because I wouldn't have wanted that. Um, but I use it as a thought partner as well. I use it to help me give me guidance and feedback on my writing. Um... And I don't know, do you have any other questions before I keep talking about this forever? No, I love it. I love it. No, I was, it it's, I think what the teacher said is very true, that it did have, in knowing you uh, as well as I do, that it had your kind of voice to it. So yeah, it really, I guess, just enhanced it. Yeah. And that's what it does. That's what AI does. It accelerates our work. If you use it the right way, all it does is accelerates your work. So one of my two big quotes from the year is um, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. So you could literally do anything. And so what I learned, so one year ago today, if you said to me, Alana, you're going to have a podcast and you're going to write a book. One year ago, I would tell you that you're insane. You're crazy. At this point, I only had a webinar and there's only like maybe two or three episodes. It turned into a podcast in April and I didn't even write the words on a page until April. So in March of last year, I had no, I would have told you you were insane. So the big thing I learned was like, you could do anything and any one of us could do anything. You just have to want to put in the time and the work to do it and use AI to help you, right? Because you can do anything, but you can't do everything because time is very limited. So like time is an investment 
That's another thing I learned. And you have to spend it wisely. So where are you going to put in your time? And if AI can help you, use it because your time is limited. So have it expedite your work. Have it make a first draft. You can make it the final product your own, but really leveraging AI as your assistant, um, feed it your thoughts, ideas, have it you know, expand upon them for you and then just go back and tweak it. But I would never have been able to do all of the things I did last year if I didn't use AI. It really, it it just expedited the work. The work I still believe is my own. It just helped me get there quicker. I think accelerated is a good, it's a good word for that. So you've gone through, you just said, if you asked last year, what would you do? You know, you wouldn't ne have never believed that you've done a book and a podcast. So what are your future projects? What do you think is going to happen next? <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. I, I don't even like to answer that question because I wouldn't have known what my year would have looked like. And um, I guess so this is, so John Spencer challenged me. So I'm starting a blog I'm working on revamping my web, stamping my website now in a week or so, maybe two weeks. I don't know. Right now it's a Google site and I'm moving to WordPress and I'm going to start a blog. Um, I don't, and again, you know, you have to do what's manageable to you. So right now I'm committing to one blog post a month, but it might be two, but I'm going to start small and stick with what's manageable and add on to it. Um, and then I'm starting, um, well, I had a newsletter. I didn't post that frequently. So I'm going to really try to do one a week, but not not like they're not going to be long. It's just going to be like if I posted a podcast or a blog that week and then just like I'm calling it a mixtape because this is a new thing that I'm, I'm going to write about. So like a DJ. So I used to call in the book, I call it a curator. Like you have to be a curator with AI and pick and choose what resonates with you. Um, but that's not a very child friendly term. They don't really resonate with an art curator. But if you're like a DJ, they all kind of get that reference. You pick and choose like the beats and the tunes and the songs that resonate with you and you make a little playlist. So I'm going to make um, a mixtape or a playlist and just put maybe curate other resources that I found and they might not be my own. So I'm going to start a weekly email. So if you go to my website, which will probably be my new website when this comes out and you sign up, I'm just going to make a little mixtape of resources, short, sweet, quick. I'm starting that. And then, yeah, I don't know. I thought about a new book idea and I just wasn't super passionate about it. I wrote a, maybe a page or two of outline. And I think for me, the most important thing is, and for myself and every one of us educators, it's just doing what you're passionate about. If the project isn't passionate to you, then just don't do it. Just do, we have very limited time and, and bandwidth. So make sure you love what you do. Yeah, I was going to say that as well, because I think your book really brings out passion and you hit on it a little bit before that it really kind of consolidated a lot of your ideas about education in general. So the passion really shone through on, on, on the book. So yeah, it jumps off the page, actually. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So it is time for the Wheel of Geek questions here. We'll just uh, do maybe two or three. Okay. Um, I'll kind of spin the wheel here. All right. What is your favorite social network? Go with that one. Um, so the two I use the most frequently are X and LinkedIn. Uh, but I think that, um, I don't know. I think a lot of educators are on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should start posting on there too. <laughs> But the ones that I go to the most frequently are X and LinkedIn. So if you're looking for me, that's where you can find <laughs> most content. Yeah, I, I do like those as well, especially professionally. Yeah, I think uh, I learn the most from that. Like, I I don't know. I think they're professional. And I think maybe TikTok and Instagram and Facebook are like these influencer -y videos more. And it's yeah. not content that I like to receive. But maybe my audience likes to receive that. So maybe I need to rethink what I'm posting. But all right, so let's go with the next one. What's your favorite way to unplug from technology? Um, So it's funny because we don't use the P word in my office. That <laughs> could be printer, paper, <laughs> pens, pencils, any P word, we don't use it. I don't like paper ever. But it's funny because when I want to unplug, like completely unplug, I, I actually prefer reading paper books because I look at a screen all day long and I tried to do a Kindle. I really tried, but I feel like I don't even want to look at any screen. Like 
I, I just want to put it all the screens away. And so I read paper books and I love to read them by any body of water. So like the ocean, a lake, a pool. I like to sit under an umbrella. So there's no sun though, but I just like being by the water reading paper books. That's what I like to do. All right. Uh, last one. What is your favorite tablet? iPad? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so for my own teachers, I bought them surfaces that have detachable screens. The new ones don't have that anymore. So I bought all the last ones before they detach. Now they kind of fold into each other. I find that to be a little bit more bulky. And for our students, they have a two-in-one Dell Windows laptops that flip into a tablet. And I just feel like it's a full-blown Windows 10, almost Windows 11 device that also has writing capabilities and they have styluses. So I like the I like the power behind that. Um, personally, I don't have an iPad because I just feel like I either have my phone or my computer. I don't really feel a need for an in-between. I just either want to have something light, portable, and small or something big and robust. Okay. All right. Well, Alana, you are doing great work. You're an inspiration and uh, can't wait to see what's coming next. Thank you. A thank lot you of great so things. much for having me and thank you so much for being patient because I got sick two times. I know. You we know, were supposed so to do this in January. <laughs> I know. I got COVID and then I got rebound COVID, which I didn't know was a thing. And then I got a stomach virus and then I sprained my ankle. It has been a year. Oh, so I thank well, you for your patience. It's worth the wait. Thank you. All right. Thank you.